Because of every age Wouldn't you like to see something strange Come with us and you will see This is our land of Halloween Welcome, my friends, to the first Law Finder Nightmare Edition Because what could be scarier than learning? For our first delve into Galarian's dark side, I can think of no better place to start than the immortal Principality of Ustalav. This is a land where your greatest fears are given shape. Vampires stalk the cities, werewolves roam the countryside, and the dead rarely remain so. But don't fail to see the forest for the trees. There's more to be afraid of than just monsters here. Secretive cabals and cultists Pull this country's strings and turn its people against each other from the shadows. But let's start from the beginning, shall we? The annals of Ustalav are stained with blood. It all started in the Age of Enthronement, when the hero Sovidia Ustav united the Varusian wanderers of the Hungry Mountains under his banner and led them against the native Kelids to drive them out of their land, pushing them towards the realms of Numeria and the World Wound. After many long years of war, Ustav had claimed victory, and his people abandoned their nomadic lifestyles in order to settle in what was then on known as the Kingdom of Ustalav. Every kingdom suffers from growing pains, but for Ustalav, this was a particularly painful transition, going from a loose collection of free folk to an absolute monarchy. Eventually, someone had the idea of splitting the territory into 16 different counties, each loyal to the crown but largely independent of one another. As luck would have it, this would lead to a golden age of prosperity for the next 900 years. Alas, they did not make it to a thousand, for an ancient warlord was resurrected from the dead and began a bloody crusade through the nation, killing anyone in his path. Such a shame that no one shared with them the secret of surviving in a horror story. You never split up. This warlord was none other than Tarbafon, who was killed by Eridan himself over 2,000 years prior, and now he had returned as a powerful lich, bestowing upon himself the title of the Whispering Tyrant. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a normal lich is already a force to be reckoned with. They are ants compared to Tarbafon. His mythical power over life and death made him second only to the gods themselves. It is no exaggeration to describe him as one of the most powerful beings to ever exist. This was the hand that fate had dealt poor Ustalav. Needless to say, there was little hope for them. The Whispering Tyrant not only rose an army of the dead to fight for him, but also united the Orc tribes of Belksen under his banner, and had them invade from the west. For every soldier that was felled by his armies, another one joined his ranks. Of those that remained, hope seemed a distant memory. It was not the end of the world, but you could see it from here. Believing Ustalav's fate to be sealed, most of their neighbours abandoned them to the Horde. To this day, Ustalav has never forgiven the elves of the nearby Kionin for ignoring their call in their most dire hour. Not even Eridan himself wished to face the tyrant again, so instead he sent his herald to lead an army of righteous paladins known as the Shining Crusade to stop the Whispering Tyrant. Tarbafon took this challenge to his rule very seriously. He knew he could not afford to take a herald of the only man who had ever defeated him lightly. And so, he stepped outside, waved his hand in the air, destroying the Divine Herald, and then went back inside and put the kettle on. It was a true battle of the ages. It was only with the sacrifices of the Shining Crusade and a little Divine Intervention that after 600 years of ruling Ustalav, the Whispering Tyrant was finally sealed in his fortress tower known as the Gallow Spire, thus returning the land to what remained of its people. Now, bear in mind that I said sealed, because not even the participation of Iomade herself, back when she was still mortal, but a badass, was enough to give him his second death. But don't worry, I'm sure we've seen the last of him. As for the country itself, how does it fare after all of that? To see that it's seen better days would be quite the understatement. For one thing, they lost a significant amount of land to the survivors of the Shining Crusade, who established the independent nation of Last Wall. From here, they protect Ustalav from the Orcs of Belksen, and ensure that the Whispering Tyrant stays in his prison. Speaking of which, the Gallowspire and the area around it 
known as Village, are plagued by so many magical storms and spirits as to serve as a veritable no-man's land. Of the old sixteen noble houses of Ustalav, only two survived the purge, and little in the way of blood connects them to Soividio Ustal. The very land itself had been reshaped by those six hundred years, as well as the creatures that inhabited it. Although the Whispering Tyrant had been defeated, his followers escaped his fate, and hid themselves wherever men feared to tread. No one knows if it's because of the influence of the Tyrant himself, or his absence, but the lands of Ustalav soon started crawling with horrors that had not been seen for an age. Fertile lands turned barren, and the once prosperous kingdom was left a shadow of its former self. Besides Verlich, Ustalav is divided into two major sections. There's Soivida, which includes the nine counties still ruled by feudal lords. Here you will find the capital city of Caliphas and its prince. Largely independent, the counties have generations of hatred and bitterness for each other that often results in small, armed conflicts. I would describe it as Game of Thrones, except you're more likely to get a conclusion. Meanwhile, in the northwest, people there call themselves the Palatinates. Forty years ago, their disappointment with their weak rulers reached a boiling point, causing a brief but surprisingly bloodless revolution. Perhaps some nations could learn something from this example. They replaced their feudal lords with elected parliaments that essentially have the same responsibilities as a count. Naturally, since none of the nobles were killed by the aforementioned revolution, they would find themselves having to entertain a revolving door of commoners with open political discussions about the country's future, an idea that I'm sure they were absolutely thrilled about. Since we're already on the topic of nobility, the Prince of Ustalav is called Adad Ordranti, a man known more for his love of hunting than his abilities as a ruler. As someone who was used to the company of soldiers and adventurers, he has little patience for his decadent court, who argue endlessly over every inch of land. While the prince holds considerable power, the counts hold on to too much money and influence to accept any policy they don't want. Through a complex series of political intrigue and possibly a bit of murder, the counts have effectively transformed their respective domains into their own independent states. The counts can do as they please, and the prince can do nothing to stop them, short of preventing a genocide or cancelling Halloween. The citizens of Ustalav are very different depending on where you go. Out in the countryside, they are a superstitious folk, ruled by their own fears and pagan beliefs. While they are certainly not cowards, the Ustalovic would rather ward off monsters trying to eat them than risk their lives facing them head on. Within every generation, a few brave souls will seek to change that mentality and rid their homeworld of the monsters that infest it. Unfortunately, they don't usually live to see their third level. For those they leave behind, there's not much difference between a hero and a fool. Focusing on these strange superstitions for a moment, they have their history rooted in the Varician's wandering days, when every village or family had a wise old woman who knew what spices would ease a cold, and how to test whether your daughter's new boyfriend was a werewolf. While many of these old wives' tales are nothing more than bullshit, some of them have a basis in truth, as half-remembered advice from real mages or forgotten magic. Some of their other traditions include fortune-telling using animal bones and harrow cards, as well as playing the Golarian equivalent of a Ouija board. They have a lot of respect for their dead, staying as far away from graveyards as possible when they can, and burying their dead wrapped in chains or weighed down with rocks so that Uncle Ted can finally stop inviting himself to dinner. The people of the big cities, however, have a very different mindset. Superstition is seen as a weakness of the ignorant peasants, unfit for the sophistication of the upper class. Safe behind their walls, the citizens are guided by pride and skepticism. Why should they worry about vampires, a creature most of them will never see, even if it may be tearing out their neighbor's throat at this very moment, and they call the peasants ignorant. But enough about superstition. Now let's turn to, in what most settings would be the same thing, faith. The most popular gods are Desna, which stems from Ustala's Varusian heritage, and Farazma, which is not surprising given their mutual dislike of the undead. But not everyone worships her in the conventional way. A sect of her worshippers, called the Farazman Penitents, have sprung up in the kingdom. They preach that misery and stoicism weigh in one's favour during Farazma's final judgement, and thus the secret to a better afterlife 
is to live a life of suffering and emotional stagnation. I guess I have something to look forward to now. Many have joined this life of somber penance and ceremonious worship for the promise of greater rewards in the afterlife, and have gone to great lengths to always be a stick in the mud. Speaking of cults, we would be remiss not to mention the Anaphexia Thought Killers, a group of worshippers of Norgorba that pretend to be a sect of monks belonging to Phrasma. They hunt down and kill those with important secrets after stealing everything they know, before bringing it back to their monastery and archiving those secrets. To ensure that that knowledge never spreads, they cut out their own tongues to make sure that they take it with them to their graves. Not the most glamorous lifestyle, but they do get some noteworthy abilities, like smelling thoughts and communicating without words. Alternatively, they could have simply learned sign language and kept their tongues but well. It's their life. If being silent and or miserable isn't your thing, then there's also the Whispering Way, a philosophy that proclaims undeath as the truest form of existence. Since the undead know no pain or fear, they can dedicate themselves fully to the pursuit of power and the destruction of the living. This is something they plan to accomplish by setting free the Whispering Tyrant from his prison, now that Eridan is gone and Iomade is busy fighting the World Wound's demons. If successful, they could bring about the destruction of all life on Golarion. I don't know about you, but I think we're better off, silent and miserable. Of course, if you'd prefer to talk to a cult that isn't completely insane, then you could join the esoteric order of the Palatine Eye. They specialize in occult magic and work to make sure that those whispering way jerks never succeed in their goal. But those are just the tip of the iceberg as far as secret societies and cults go in Ustalav. Many of them are simply biding their time before they put their machinations into action. For this final section, we have decided to try something new. We'll be going over some law-friendly character concepts that would fit right in with Ustalav, including some races and classes. The humans in Ustalav are mostly of Varisian descent, but there are a number of Kelids that face discrimination in the northern parts of the country. From the neighbouring Five King Mountains comes the Dwarfs, working as traders, in addition to the many native Dwarfs in the country due to their tin and salt mining industries. Half-Orcs are rather common thanks to the country's proximity to the hold of Belkson, and as descendants of the Orc hordes that once served Tarbathon, you can imagine how popular they are. You might assume that there was just as many elves in their kin, since Kionin is so close, but sadly not. Many still resent them for abandoning Ustalav during the conquest. They know when they aren't wanted. There are exceptions, of course. Some elves that personally experience the horrors of the Whispering Tyrant make sure the younger generations of elves don't forget. Ustalav is also home to a good number of Dampir and Changelings, which I'm sure will be quite a popular choice. Lastly, there are many full-blooded orcs still in Ustalav, many of which work as adventurers. One thing to bear in mind, however, is that they are much more likely than their half-orc brothers to face an angry mob when they try to go into town, so just bear that in mind. Moving on to classes, let's start with the Barbarians. They are considered synonymous with the Kelids, and treated poorly as a result, as opposed to Bards, which the Ustalavik associate with their own Varisian culture. There's also many art colleges, such as the Karko Conservatory. Now, alchemists have a very special place here. Universities in cosmopolitan cities like Caliphus often hide dark research that may or may not include the creation of flesh golems using a bolt of lightning. Of these many institutions, Lebenstadt University, home to the famed duelists, is perhaps the most famous of them all. Paladins never find themselves out of work in this country for obvious reasons. They usually come from Last Wall and worship Iomade. There's also a lot of local Seren Ray fans. You could join the Phrasma Inquisitors and hunt undead in a red trench coat. Or perhaps you feel like defeating monsters with a whip, like a certain famous clan. I'm sure there's a way to make that work. And for the finisher, we have the Investigators, with Ustalav housing the best in the world, such as the world-famous Sleepless Detective Agency, known for their skills in forensic analysis of blood and magic, which can tell you everything you need to know about who done it. And that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this little experiment, and if you'd like us to make sections based around character concepts in future episodes, be sure to let us know in the comments. Happy Halloween.